Hello friends, my name is JJ, and today I would like to talk about one of the most important building blocks of our modern global economy, the trade of natural resources. This is obviously a very detailed topic, as most economic matters are, but the big idea I just want to get across today is that the trade of natural resources is actually a surprisingly recent phenomenon, perhaps less than 200 years old, and is very heavily tied to all sorts of other interesting themes that have defined the building of our modern world, including a deepening understanding of nature, the rise of industrial technology, and the emergence of middle-class consumerism, which I think can make the natural resource trade a topic that can be quite interesting to think and talk about, even if you don't otherwise consider yourself all that interested in economics. So by the 10th century or so, boat technology had gotten good enough for people to begin leaving their own continents and making long voyages to places on the other side of the world, but it would take another 800 years before humans could figure out a way to make much money from this. In the early days, groups like the Vikings and later the Spanish conquistadors simply robbed foreign nations and took their gold, which was the global currency of the time. This approach would later be adapted into the early economic theory of mercantilism, which argued that there was a fixed amount of wealth in the world and the only way to get rich was to take from those who had more. Other early explorers, including the Arabs in India and the Europeans in Asia and North America, made money buying exotic goods from foreign continents, like silk and furs and spices and handicrafts and selling them to rich people back in their home countries. But this was a very limited elite practice that didn't really have much relevance to the vast majority of people. Mercantilism and the quest for elite luxuries was enough to justify the creation of overseas colonies, but even centuries after the modern age of European imperialism began in the 15th century, the vast majority of trade in the world continued to occur within countries rather than between them. As the economic historian Brad DeLong writes in this excellent book, Slouching Towards Utopia, an Economic History of the 20th Century, as recently as the year 1700, what we would call international trade was at most 6% of global economic life. About 3% of what a typical region consumed was imported from elsewhere, and about 3% of what a typical region produced was exported elsewhere. This began to change after 1700, but international trade in 1800 was still, at most, just 6% of global economic life. By the early 1910s, he notes, however, international National trade was closer to 20% of the global economy, and by the mid-1970s, it was about 30%. Today, it is around 60%. So, what changed? Well, Brad is a big believer that the growth of global trade is mostly a story of technology, specifically the technology of learning how to harvest and use natural resources. Take plants, for example. As people began to tromp around the world, they began to realize that some of the world's most luxurious crops might actually grow better and produce a bigger harvest if they were grown outside the area they were native to. The Europeans first discovered sugarcane in Asia, for example, but then decided to grow it in their colonies in the Caribbean, accurately concluding that the tropical climate would be an ideal place to grow a plant that needs a lot of warmth and sunlight. Coffee has a similar story. The plant is native to the Middle East, but the Europeans brought it to places like South America and Indonesia which have a similar climate, but more agricultural land in which to grow it. Wheat is not indigenous to North America, but Canada and the United States provided some of the most hospitable territory in the world to farm it. Now, harvesting crops on a mass scale, and especially transporting them around the world with speed and efficiency, wasn't possible without the sort of modern agricultural machinery that was produced during the fabulous Industrial Revolution that kicked off during the late 18th century. And those Miracle machines didn't just fall from the sky, they had to be built from materials like steel and chrome and copper and zinc. And to power those machines, we also needed fuel like petrol and coal, which begat a huge interest in mining projects as nations around the world started digging in their backyards and the backyards of their colonies to figure out if any of these precious minerals could be found. And of course, many places were pleasantly surprised. Now, this growing knowledge that some parts of the world were best suited to farm or mine certain things 
led to the popularity of a theory that would have tremendous consequence for the way that the global economy was organized. The theory of competitive advantage. Broadly speaking, this argument posited that rather than have a country try to make everything it needed for itself, which had been the old way of doing things, countries should instead figure out what they can produce best and then sell that stuff to other countries that want it and then use the profits from the sale to buy things that they want but can't make from other countries. One of the earliest and darkest examples of this form of global goods exchange was the so-called triangle trade between Europe, Africa, and America that existed from the early 1600s to the mid 19th century. The Europeans used the resources that they had access to to make manufactured goods and sold them to the Africans. The Africans in turn sold slaves to the Europeans. The slaves were then sold to slave owners in the Caribbean and Americas who would use them to harvest sugar or cotton, which could then be sold back to Europe, some of which was then made into goods like cloth and rum that could be sold to the Africans for more slaves. Every place was selling what they believed made them the most unique under the theory of competitive advantage and thus generated maximum profits, though Obviously, this created hideous consequences for at least one third of the goods. In most cases, however, open trade among nations based on the principle of competitive advantage did bring considerable economic gains to the peoples of any country that participated. Trade helped foster the growth of industries that provided stable jobs to workers in all corners of the planet, while also bringing in large quantities of useful and affordable new consumer goods to middle-class shoppers as opposed to just pointless luxuries for a small handful of aristocrats. So, let us now flash forward to the 1970s, just to get a clearer picture of how this whole system panned out. I think the 1970s are a good era to consider, because they are a full century from the 1870s, which is when Brad DeLong considers the modern era of global trade to have started, but it's also sufficiently far away from the current year, which is relevant because a lot of the way that countries practice trade today has come as a response to the state of trade in the 1970s. So, as I said earlier, by the 1970s, global trade had leapt to 30% of the global economy compared to just 6% in 1800, and that was generally also the case at the level of individual countries. Most had about 20% and up of their economies based around trade. So let us now look at a couple of charts, which I will be pulling from this excellent book, the State of the World Atlas, published in 1981. So here are the countries of the world sized by how much stuff they export to other countries circa 1978. And obviously what we first see is how unequal things are. America and Western Europe completely dominate world trade, while Africa and South America are comparatively tiny players. The Asian countries are sort of mid, but Japan clearly dominates. Now, what is interesting is if we overlay this map with this color-coded one, which shows the countries that derive the majority of their trade income from selling 15 types of goods or more, which are colored in purple, versus those who derive the majority of their trade income from just selling two to four products, which are colored in blue, and those that derive the majority of their trade income from just selling one product, which are colored in green. And as you can see, there is some pretty strong correlation. And this in many ways illustrates how the competitive advantage system worked out in practice. In theory, the reason why Western Europe, America, and Japan wound up on top is because they enjoyed a competitive advantage in a large number of unique areas. On the one hand, these countries were broadly blessed in terms of how many different natural resources their lands could produce. The bountiful territories of Canada produced not only a lot of wheat, but also ample supplies of timber, corn, and beef, for example. While the fertile islands of Japan were home to plenty of coal, fish, rice, and tea. But, just as significantly, these were also the countries that industrialized the fastest and most thoroughly, which is to say the ones that built up a lot of big factories in the late 19th century and continued to do so throughout the 20th, allowing their competitive advantage to transition 
from raw natural resources to manufactured goods like clothing and dishes and books and toys and clocks and chairs and musical instruments and all the rest. And it also didn't hurt that a lot of these countries were also great military powers with an ability to conquer weaker nations and use their land to grow or mine these sort of raw materials that they needed to make a lot of those manufactured goods, as well as the machines that made them. So let's take France, for example, a place which had risen throughout the 19th and 20th centuries to become one of the richest, most industrialized countries in the world, and for a time, the head of a great global empire as well. Let me tell you what their top five exports were in 1972. According to this UN Handbook on International Trade and Development Statistics, which I got from my local library. Number one, cars. Number two, non-electric machinery and appliances. Number three, liquor. Number four, non-fur clothing. Number five, sheet metal of iron or steel. So basically, all manufactured goods. Additionally, as we saw from the map, even when put together, France's top five exports only represented a small fraction of the value of their exports overall. Indeed, by the mid-1970s, France was exporting a truly massive array of different goods, 182 in all, according to the UN, the highest of any country in Europe. Now let us compare France to Cuba, an island country in the Caribbean that had once been a colony of Spain and then the United States. Cuba exported only seven goods in 1972, with their top export, the natural resource of sugar, representing a whopping 78% of their overall export value. Other countries in a similar situation in 1972 included Iceland, where 63% of their export wealth came from fish, Chile, where 67% of their export wealth came from copper, Liberia, where 75% came from iron ore, and Burundi, where a staggering 85% of their export wealth came from coffee. Now deriving so much of your trade wealth from the sale of only one raw natural resource doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. The countries of the Middle East, for instance, had long struggled to figure out what they had to sell that the rest of the world wanted until they discovered that they had oil. Oil is obviously an extremely desired commodity and the countries that trade it have generally been able to pull in a a lot of wealth for themselves over the decades without ever facing much pressure to change. It is also worth noting that even though a lot of countries began their particular competitive advantage strategy under some degree of colonial duress, even after independence, a lot of them continued to believe in that strategy and continued to pursue an economy structured around the same limited number of export goods. But overall, I think that the mainstream economic conclusion these days is that, yeah, having your exports dominated by a single unprocessed natural resource probably isn't the best strategy. For one, it tends to keep your country pretty rural and pre-industrial, since it's hard for a country that derives so much of its wealth from farming and mining to justify building anything but a lot of farms and mines. It can also result in a lot of your country's labor being directed towards a product with little to no domestic use. If a country grows a lot of wheat, in theory, they can use that wheat to feed themselves as well as the rest of the world. But during the 20th century, you often had this grotesque spectacle of African countries with huge agricultural sectors that were nevertheless starving because all they grew was unhealthy stuff like cocoa and coffee for the benefit of foreign consumers. And lastly, of course, there are always inherent dangers of putting all of your export eggs in a single resource basket, given that a resource that is popular one day might be unpopular the next. This is very much the anxiety of all of the oil exporting countries, that one day energy technology might progress in a way that makes oil-based fuels less desirable in the same way that much of the world has now stopped using coal for fuel. It has now been over 50 years since the 1970s, and it is interesting to see how the state of trade in the world 
has both changed and hasn't changed in several important ways since then. Trade in the 2020s is still overwhelmingly dominated by a handful of big industrialized nations whose exports have only become more diversified and more based on high-end manufactured goods. But a big change is that a lot of countries in the developing world have also put a lot of effort into trying to diversify their economies as well. For example, let us take a second look at some of those countries we talked about earlier. Iceland has very cheap electricity, which they get from harnessing the geothermal energy of all of their volcanoes. In the 1990s, they began using this as a way to lure American aluminium companies to their island since the smelting of aluminium is very energy intensive and electricity is a lot more expensive in the US. It has proven very successful and Iceland has now cut their dependency on fish exports in half. Chile has similarly halved their dependence on copper in favor of taking advantage of their warm climate to significantly expand their fruit farming and wine making industries. Liberia, meanwhile, has greatly lessened its dependence on the export of iron ore, in part because they discovered gold, but also because they created this novel industry. Selling ship registration licenses to foreign shipping companies that don't want to obey the strict regulations of their own countries. And then good old Burundi also discovered gold in the 1990s and began mining it in earnest. Today they don't export a lot of gold, but even the small amount they do sell is worth as much as their coffee. But on the other hand, it is also the case that a lot of the green countries from the 1970s have still remained far more loyal to just producing a small handful of natural resources than we might have presumed. And a big reason for this is a country we have not mentioned yet, China. China spent much of the last century as a fairly marginal country in global trade, but since the 1970s and their move away from orthodox communism, which tends to preach economic self-sufficiency over doing business with the outside world, it has now become an international trade superpower. In particular, the rapid rise of Chinese industrialization, urbanization, and manufacturing that we've witnessed over the last 20 years has begat a lot of Chinese demand for raw materials like copper and iron and rubber and oil and wheat and all the rest of it, which has in turn provided a lifeline to the economies of many of the poorer resource producing countries whose goods might otherwise not be wanted or needed as much by the Western industrialized countries anymore. This is why people sometimes say that China is emerging as the great imperial power of the 21st century, not because they are necessarily expected to conquer the world or anything, but just because the way in which they are encouraging certain countries to pursue their competitive advantage when it comes to the export of raw resources to them in exchange for Chinese manufactured goods has a lot of similarities to the ways in which the great Western empires behaved in the 19th and 20th centuries. But that is a topic for another time. So here is a closing discussion question I have for you guys. I would be curious to know how many of you have some family connection to the broad realm of natural resource production. In my case, my great-grandfather was an immigrant from Italy who came over to Canada in the early 20th century to work in the gold mines of Northern Ontario. Gold was a major export of Canada in the old days, but for a variety of reasons, that's less the case now. So I often think of my great-grandfather as a kind of personal link to Canada's resource-centric past. I mean, I've obviously also known people that have some connection to Canada's natural resource present as well, in terms of people whose parents were wheat farmers or men my age who worked in the oil fields of Alberta and things like that. But I still think there's a certain quaintness to jobs like that these days, even though I know that that's definitely not the case in many parts of the world. So let's hear some of your stories and I will see you next week.